ritual where one begins with a prayer or a writ, creating a form of action. And instead of the penitent, one might be called the defendant. Then one must go through uh, the um, confession, the auricular confession, and the act of contrition or remorse, then the absolution, and if one shows adequate remorse, one might receive a form of penance as opposed to a more severe punishment for one who is not penitent. If this sounds familiar to you, it should be. Because understanding this knowledge breaks open the ecclesiastical process that is embedded in every single court procedure in every private uh, court of the private bar around the world. It is the sacrament of penance that we are receiving when we enter their court. Even if the judge, the prosecutor and the lawyer tells you flat stick as a lie that there is no ecclesiastical authority whatsoever, they are either lying or they are incredibly ignorant to the source of the ritual. It is the sacrament of penance. And the cause of action, the hearing of a court, cannot commence without the perfected writ. And what is the writ? The writ is the uncompleted, the incompleted indulgence. That is not completed until the act of absolution has completed it. The sentence completes it. And it is signed and witnessed. <clears throat> So now we have some knowledge of what underpins the magic that underpins a court action, every court action in the Western world as the creation of indulgences. And no wonder they can issue bonds because an indulgence is a negotiable instrument. Of course, they can make money from it, but it requires the ceremony and the ritual to be perfected. And if it's not perfected, if the writ is deficient, the summons is deficient. The cause of action cannot proceed. Now, we have not really even begun to deal with some of these areas, and we will. Trust me, we will be working on forms of remedy here where they are deficient because there is enormous opportunity in identifying the failure of writs to be perfected and therefore the cause of action being wholly unlawful. So there are deep insights relevant insights into this research. As crazy as it sounds, there are deep and relevant insights. Now again, why is this important? Well, it's important because it gives us some deeper meaning as to the symbolism and the significance of, of, of issuing documents that are sealed in blood. Particularly when we ensure that those documents are absolutely conforming to the nature of indulgences and are themselves the offset and the balance of any sin. So that if the court or if any part of the Roman system proceeds, and we can prove that the account in the temporal realm had been balanced just as it has been balanced in heaven, then we're dealing with the very worst heretics. And the Jesuits have sworn a sacred and solemn oath to eliminate heretics, to remove heretics. Well, if we honour the process and these heretics are not removed, then we go back to the original intention of perfecting their dishonour. If the system does not honour its base, if they throw away the foundation stone, what happens to the temple? A temple without a foundation stone collapses. And that is exactly what we're doing. This is not about getting a little bit of remedy for ourselves and hoping in the future that it won't come back like some terrible weed. It is about consuming, perfecting the law, restoring the law, and, and ensuring that this age is over. Well, indulgences are alive and well. In the common law, in the, common law, in the negotiable instruments, in the canon law, and we even find that under canon law of the Roman cult that we have the ability 
and the Canon 995. Only those to whom this power is acknowledged in the law or granted by the Roman pontiff can bestow indulgences. So, if we can evoke the ancient rules of law that are within the sacred scripture of the Old Testament, then we have every right to issue the instruments, and hence the power of Leviticus. Leviticus is the birthplace in law of the rules of Mithra. These rules of Mithra are the origin of the blood sacrifice and the atonement and the concept of punishment and purification that pervades all law and all their rituals. So if they dishonour Leviticus, if they dishonour indulgences, if they dishonour the ancient law, they dishonour everything that has been created since then. Everything. It is earth-shattering because it means they cannot possibly act in law if they dishonour their own system from the very beginning. I give some examples of different types of indulgences and indulgences for everything. Indulgences for the conception of a baby, indulgences at approaching death, the use of sacred objects like money, First Communion, attending a church or oratory, a court, where there's a visiting, visiting judge. So wherever a courthouse has a visiting judge, they can issue indulgences. Sound familiar? Usually one judge is visiting. You should look it up. You should find the plenipotentiary or the prothonotary is considered a visiting judge and not a permanent judge. Prayer for the dead. So there's all these different areas where we find indulgences. Now, how do we prove this? How do we prove this? And then how do we use this knowledge in the uh, updates of the ecclesiastical deed polls that we're dealing with? Well, it turns out, in the research that we've been doing on notorial procedure, that there is and has been and is acknowledged that there are two key types of notaries that have existed from the beginning of negotiable instruments. The notary public and the scrivener or the scrivener notary, the S-C-R-I-V-E-N-E-R notary. And the scrivener notaries have their own websites and are quite proud of the fact that they date themselves back to at least 1371, 1373. What's more, when you look at what a scrivener notary has has the ability to do. A scribe or a notary is the only type of notary that can originate, key word, and originate instruments. A notary public can, can be a registrar, can hold a public record in due course, but a notary public normally cannot issue original form, original uh, form of action. They can only record cause of action. So they can, they can register protest notes but none of that is the original form of action, only the recording of cause of action. So they can, a notary public can be a judge, but they cannot originate the form. A scrivener can originate the form. And when you look at them, it's the scriveners that do all the um, original designs of uh, banknotes and all the original designs of bonds and all the original designs of all the financial, key financial instruments that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And once they've created an original design, it's then sold to whoever's using it, and then every one thereafter is considered an extract. You heard the word extract? Well, it's an extract. Whether it be a birth certificate, it's an extract. A death certificate. Scribers create those. And then they go out and are used by society, and every one of them is an extract. And an extract is a salvage. Of course, what can you do with a salvage? You can charge a fee for a salvage. So they're there. They're there in London. Their power is without dispute. They are the clerks and the ultimate scribes at the center of the financial industry throughout the world. No question. They are the ones who write the instruments that drive the global financial system. That's not my words. You can go and see it for yourself. Well, what does a scrivener mean? Well, it's two Latin words. The first word is scribo, with the B-O removed. It makes sense. And scribo means a scribe. 
And the second part, venner, comes from venai, and that means indulgence. They tell us, in plain sight, that the most important positions for originating negotiable instruments in the world are scribes of indulgences. There you have it. In plain sight, they tell you that indulgences is the base form that makes all negotiable instruments work. Okay. With that knowledge, it was far time for us to start putting that to use in the perfection and strengthening of our instruments. Remember, we're not changing our intent here, but we are raising the stakes. No judge, no prosecutor, no lawyer has any, no registrar has any right whatsoever to deny the authority or the strength or the validity of any instruments you have issued. And yet they continue to mock, to laugh, to dishonour, to disgrace. Well, now it's time to see what happens at a national level when national lawyers and, and national secretaries and national officials behave the same way. I suspect things will change fairly quickly. So let's have a look at some of the changes in this in mind. Well, there was another change that we looked at, and I'm going to go to uh, the um, what's called the registrar steps. And I'm going, I get to this either by the contents or I get to this either by clicking on registrar steps. And I'm going to look at the uh, first step, which needs to be updated. And I apologize for it not being updated, but it needs to be updated. Uh, I'm going to go down, in fact, I'll go to the contents page in the links and I'll go to step one deed of restitution. Well, many of you have heard the story of the prodigal son and one of the things that we discovered again in the research in the last week is that we were underestimating when we talked about CEST KV we were underestimating the number of roles that they have instituted in order to control us I thought and many thought that when you read the, the CEST KV that we were talking about lost or abandoned or minor or incompetent. <clears throat> I was wrong. It's and. The or in that case is and. So what they've done is they've not just made us lost or abandoned or minor or incompetent and filial, they've gone lost and abandoned and we're a minor and we're incompetent and we're filial. We are considered the children of the state. So there are five points of control not one. Now that takes a whole different complexion because some of you, a number of you, and I again many, many thanks, many thanks to the likes of Terry Lynn and others who have done outstanding work in helping people realise the importance of establishing power, of denying consent to power of attorney and withdrawing consent, withdrawing the power of attorney role before one can really move forward on this. And the way to explain it is a bit like this. Until we have removed their presumption of, or assumption of power of attorney, it's a bit like us walking into a bank as a 10-year-old and saying, give me my money. What would the bank manager do? The bank manager would say to the kid, go away, go home. Where's your mother? Where's your father? They'd laugh and they'd do nothing. The same as if that 10-year-old child went into court and said, I protest. I object. The judge would say, well, where's your mother, your father, or your guardian? I, I can't have you talk in my court. You're not an adult. I'll need to appoint someone there because you are clearly a minor. You're clearly not competent. You might think you know, but you're a child. Well, that is our status in their mind, despite the way we dealt with the original ecclesiastical deed polls. That is, in their mind, how they view us. So unless we address that first, we are not perfecting, if you like, to be absolutely clear that they have no choice other than to accept our non-consent, our return, 